Stranded between Russia and Britain and dominated by jagged mountains and tribal tendencies, contentment came with difficulty for Afghanistan. No previous leader had managed to tame this harsh environment, let alone govern it from a single capital. When Sher Ali Khan ascended as the monarch in 1863, he took on the exceptional task of crafting the tapestry of a nation that was impervious to outside powers. Unknowingly, the king's policy would lay the bedrock of a parallel Afghan society within the much larger populace. I'm your host Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. As the third son of Dost Muhammad, Sher Ali was tutored by none other than Said Jamaluddin Al Afghani, a leading political thinker who inspired numerous reformist and revolutionary movements throughout the Islamic world. Just after Sher Ali ascended to the throne, Jamaluddin counseled his king one last time and produced a roadmap for the modernization of Afghanistan. Then, without any explanation, Jamaluddin left for abroad, never to return. It was now up to Sher Ali to bring Afghanistan into the modern era. But before the new Afghan king could get started, his seat was immediately challenged by his brothers. It would take Sher Ali another five years to subdue his brothers and firmly consolidate his power. At which point in 1868, Sher Ali looked to Jamaluddin's roadmap for modernization and followed it to the letter. First up, the king established a postal system with a central office in Kabul and branch offices in other major cities. Most Afghans could not read or write, but at least the ruling elite and military officers had ways to communicate with greater ease. Next, Sher Ali adjusted the laws of taxation, allowing for private enterprises to do business and move beyond the feudal land ownership. Sher Ali also set up a cabinet for his government and filled the seats with those he trusted. Overseeing the process of cabinet selection was the king's wife, Mirmon Aisha. Yes, in this new Afghanistan, women would need to step up and contribute to the state. To gain the best counsel possible, Sher Ali also established a think tank that was tasked with research and development. Later, this group would develop into the splendid Afghan technocracy. The king also convened a standing assembly of the tribes in Kabul, a parliament of sorts. 2,000 representatives from all parts of Afghanistan would meet regularly and discuss national affairs. The assembly had no effective power since its role was strictly to advise the king, but it was a tremendous step towards modernity and it was decades before the Ottoman, Iranian and Russian empires would set up their own parliaments. Sher Ali was on a roll, and he could do all this because he was a man of intellect. He spent his free time reading, writing, and tinkering with mechanical devices. He even imported a lithographic press from Europe and used it to publish Afghanistan's first newspaper, the topics of which ranged from science to culture to military affairs. Soon enough, the secular paper became mandatory reading for officers in the Afghan army. At the same time, Sher Ali enacted numerous drastic military reforms. To make Afghanistan independent of foreign suppliers, the king constructed several factories that produced weaponry across the country. He also built up a professional standing army of nearly 60,000 soldiers who were trained and equipped according to Western standards. No more baggy trousers or turbans. To recruit talented officers, Sher Ali looked to British India. At the time, hundreds of Afghans were serving in the British army in India, and Sher Ali offered them incentives to return to Afghanistan and drill his new professional army. In just a decade, the courageous Sher Ali defied tradition and transformed his realm beyond recognition. Afghanistan was now producing its own weaponry, drilling its soldiers according to new standards, and was exploring secular studies. The next time an imperial force tried to dictate terms, the Afghans would be ready. 
By 1878, the great game was going strong in Central Asia. The Russian Empire had conquered and annexed the last remaining Uzbek kingdoms, while Britain had fully consolidated its will over the frontier borders of the Indian subcontinent. Afghanistan was all that stood between the bear and the lion. While Sher Ali was enacting civil and military reforms, Britain had conducted its own election, which had brought to power a new government. Lawmakers in London appointed Robert Bulwer Lytton as the Viceroy of British India. Lord Lytton, much like Lord Auckland before him, favoured a proactive policy towards Russia. An independent, neutral Afghanistan wasn't good enough. The Tsar's policy showed no signs of stopping, and at the time it did seem as if the Russians were about to invade and absorb Afghanistan. That was unacceptable for London. So Lytton figured he better show Sher Ali who was in charge. A letter was sent to Kabul where Lytton dictated that Sher Ali disinherit his heir Abdullah and name Yaqub as his successor. This was a strange request. Abdullah had been tutored by his father to have a rational attitude while Yaqub had conspired to overthrow his father and was serving jail time. Clearly, the British demand did not sit well with the Afghan king, but Sher Ali let the insult pass. Instead, he sent an envoy to Calcutta to sort things out. When the Afghan delegation arrived in the capital of British India, Lytton delivered even more extensive terms. From now on, British troops would control the borders of Afghanistan and British citizens would have the freedom to enter the country at will and do business as they seemed fit. Moreover, British citizens would be subject to British laws, not Afghan ones. King Sher Ali had enough and refused to play along. He responded to Lytton by stating that Afghans would defend their sovereignty to the last man. Just as this response was dispatched by letter, a Russian delegation had crossed into Afghan territory without permission. They were headed for Kabul. Sher Ali immediately sent letters to the Russians telling them to turn back and that they were not invited. The Russian commander, General von Kaufmann, ignored these requests and merely wrote that he was bringing gifts of perpetual friendship. In many ways, von Kaufmann's proclamation of friendship was similar to Lord Auckland's appeal of British non-interference and friendship, and just as worthless. The unfortunate political circumstances inspired a famous piece of satire, where the fragile Afghan king is surrounded by a hungry bear and lion while pleading, save me from my friends. An accurate depiction of the times. The Russians, for their part, eventually arrived in Kabul and made themselves comfortable. There wasn't much Sher Ali could do at this point. It was a blatant provocation and taking forceful measures would only trigger an even worse response. Right at this point, Sher Ali's beloved son and heir Abdullah passed away suddenly from an illness. The king took the loss especially hard. He let national affairs go unattended and retreated to his private chamber for days. When next he was seen, a witness account described the king's eyes red from weeping. Still in deep agony, Sher Ali's attention was required at a new development taking shape at the Afghan-Indian border. Apparently, Lord Lytton had dispatched a delegation to Kabul, but the Afghan troops at the border had refused to let the British pass. To rectify the insult, the British Viceroy began massing his forces. An army of 25,000 troops was mobilized to take Afghanistan. Imagine the anguish of Sher Ali. Just as he was renovating his country, the Russians had settled in Kabul and the British were still on their way. The king's talented heir had passed and an all-out war seemed imminent. Sher Ali made a final attempt to remedy the situation when he traveled north to seek an audience with the Russian Tsar, but he was refused entry into Russian territory. It is at this point that Sher Ali just gave up on life. He got ill, refused to eat, and when his leg got injured, he refused medical attention. His condition regressed and within weeks, 
at the age of 54, the first reformist king of Afghanistan died. His revolutionary ideas, however, would live on. In fact, in later decades, the king's policy would lead to the beginnings of a parallel Afghan society of urbanized and educated citizens who differed in mindset and lifestyle from their countryside kin. Succeeding Shar Ali was his treacherous son Yaqub, who had developed deep running connections with the British. Connections that would bring about his undoing and let slip the dogs of war. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our Patreon community for making content like this possible. Visit the links in the description for more information. For now, take care and sahol.